everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTUP and ESCCT. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's event. This webinar focuses on DOD-funded research efforts to develop and improve tools to support climate management uh, planning. First, Dr. Jim Yoon from the Pacific Northwest National Lab will discuss the development of a tool for assessing the exposure of climate change at overseas military facilities. Second, Dr. Pete Larson from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab will talk ab about a module enhancement to the Builder Sustainment Management System that includes evaluating the potential for extreme weather events. Each presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session, and depending on how we're doing on time, we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session. The next two slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so uh, already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you have uh, difficulty downloading Zoom, you can down view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge. Um, if your screen freezes, try keying in Control and F5 to do a hard refresh of your browser. And in case of continued technical difficulties, just download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your uh, registration confirmation email. Another option to view the webinar is to go to the CERTUP and ESCCP YouTube channel at the link shown here, as we will be uh, live streaming the proceedings. Note that today, um, today's broadcast is listen only. You can submit questions using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period. Um, to get your questions in, we encourage you to submit them well in advance of the Q&A sessions. And when you do submit them, please add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you during the Q&A session. Uh, keep in mind that the chat box is reserved for comments related to technical difficulties. So please only use the Q&A box for questions for the speakers. With that, I would like to introduce Kevin Ayers, who uh, serves as the Startup and ESCCP Program Manager for the Research Conservation and Resilience and also the Climate Resilience uh, Program areas. Kevin is responsible for identifying strategic research needs to support conservation, climate adaptation, environmental security, ecosystem management, and wildlife, wild, wild land fire management on DAD installations. He brings nearly 30 years of experience at the interface of national, uh, natural resource management and science. His academic and management work have focused on uh, fire ecology, conservation of threatened and endangered species, and the science support of prescribed fire modeling to meet ecosystem management objectives. Finally, Kevin received his master's degree in conservation ecology from the University of Georgia. Uh, Kevin, please proceed. Thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's CERTIP and ESTCP webinar. The next few slides will provide a quick overview of CERTIP and ESTCP, which together are the Department of Defense's investment in science and technology for the environment and installation energy. The programs report to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Resilience and Optimization, headquartered, headquartered at the Pentagon. CERTUP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, established by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department, Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTUP addresses high-priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on top-priority DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology de development that ultimately impact real-world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Securities Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate and validate innovative environmental and installation energy technologies. 
These investments capitalize on past projects funded under CERTA or other research programs, and they are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. Advances in science and technology provide the DOD with the tools needed to effectively manage and restore its assets to protect troops, their families, the public, and the environment. CERTIP and ESTCP investments improve installation energy resilience, environmental cleanup, UXO remediation, resource conservation, and the sustainment and maintenance of defense assets. CERTIP and ESTCP fund, monitor, and actively guide relevant and applied research, development, testing, and evaluation projects for the DOD's top environmental and, inter and installation energy challenges. Our programs currently fund over 600 active projects. To maximize research impact, CERTIP and ESTCP collaborate with top talent across uh, all sectors. In 2023, we funded projects with 77 academic institutions, 91 federal performers, and 52 industry partners. Our innovation and technology development inform DOD policy to ultimately improve environmental and energy management. Our webinar series highlights outstanding projects across all our main focus areas. Registration is open for webinars through the end of the year. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link. All past webinars are archived and can be accessed using this link. I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our webinar webpage. We would appreciate it if you can take a few moments to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the webcast. At this point, I will turn it over to Rula to introduce today's speakers, and thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Jim Yoon. Jim is a senior scientist at PNNL. His research focuses on the development and application of advanced modeling and simulation techniques to understand, quantify, and evaluate climate and socioeconomic impacts on coupled human natural systems. Jim serves as a PI for a set um, climate analyses and adaptation efforts being funded by DOD. He also leads several agent-specific um, modeling efforts within the DOE Office of Science Multi-Sector Dynamics, or MSD program. He is a member of the MSD Scientific Steering Group and chair of the MSD Human Systems Modeling Working Group. Jim received a bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering from UCLA and master's and doctoral degrees from Stanford University. Jim, please proceed. All right, thanks, Rula. Uh, first off, just thanks very much to the CERTIP ESTCP uh, team for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'll be sharing more about our project that is focused on enhancing the Department of Defense's climate assessment tool, or DCAD in short. Uh, for overseas locations in particular. Um, before I dive in here, I did want to mention that I, I believe this work may be a bit unique within the portfolio and that it's really an effort that's being carried forward hand in hand with our DOD sponsors alongside a, a wider contracting team. And our work here that I'll share is, is really a small part of that broader effort to improve and enhance DCAT. So I did want to acknowledge this broader effort off the bat. I um, also mentioned that while I served as PI on this effort, um, several very talented scientists at PNNO uh, were the ones actually conducting the hard work of data ID and data processing, um, namely Jillian Dinas, uh, Kazi Tamadin, and Kyung Ho San. So this work is really um, inde indebted to their efforts. All right, in terms of an outline for today, we'll start off with a background on the initial version of DCAT. This is a version of DCAT that actually predates our current effort and was the initial version of the tool developed by DOD. Um, from there, I'll, uh, from here forth, I'll refer to this initial version as, as DCAT version one. Um, we'll then move into discussing our extension and enhancement of DCAT for overseas locations. Uh, then I'll speak to the climate data review and data processing effort that went into this actual enhancement of the tool. And then we'll transition into opportunities for analysis that this enhancement of DCAT uh, and the general data sources and methods we, we identified and de developed really enables. Uh, and finally, we'll wrap up with conclusions and benefits to DOD and the wider community. All 
All right, so we'll start off here with a background on DCAD version one. Um, back around the 2019 timeframe, uh, the, the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Environment and Energy Resilience Office chose to proceed with the development of uh, the DOD climate assessment tool. And the purpose of this tool was to serve as a department-wide screening level climate hazard assessment tool uh, that could be used by anybody from say, a strategic level decision maker at OSD uh, to an installation level manager concerned with climate change at their specific locale. Um, I think it's important to note here as well in terms of progeny that DCAT was actually based on an even earlier geospatial tool uh, developed by the US Army Corps of Engineers known as ACAT. And in a nutshell, the purpose of DCAT is really to provide actionable assessments of future climate exposure at DOD locations of interest. And it does this by taking in the best data and models, model outputs available and processing this data into the form of climate exposure indicators, which I'll describe more uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, looking at the bottom two bullets here, an important aspect to note about this first version of DCAT is that there was really a heavy focus on CONUS and gathering high resolution data sets that can inform indicator calculation for CONUS. Um, while the initial version of the tool did include overseas locations, um, the climate data that went into the processing of the indicators for the global version of the tool was, were, were fairly coarse in nature. Um, many of the DCAT indicators that were included in CONUS were actually designated as not available for the global version uh, due to lack of authoritative global, glo globally available data sources. And we, actually, we, only had point, uh, we only had data for point locations at these international locations rather than um, complete spatial coverage. So in summary, DCAT version one had, had quite limited characterization for overseas locations. Okay. All right, next here, I wanted to provide some further detail as to the actual indicators that are contained in uh, DCAT version one. As you see here, DCAT groups indicators across eight hazard categories. Um, these include uh, coastal flooding, riverine flooding, heat, drought, energy demand, land degradation, wildfire, and historical extreme weather events. And each of these categories in turn include, includes the set of actual indicators. So just as an example here, um, days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit is an indicator that sits in the heat hazard category. Um, for all but the historical extreme conditions category, so the last row you're seeing on this table here, the tool provides information on how these hazards are projected to change over the 21st century. And these projections are based on three future epochs. So we have a base epoch um, over the historical period. We have a second focused on mid-century and then a third focused on, on late century. And the, the projections are further grouped into lower and higher scenarios based on the rate and magnitude of change for the underlying emission scenarios that are considered. And the specific climate scenarios that are, are adopted here are following the representative concentration pathways developed by the IPCC, uh, in specific RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. Uh, so in summary, we have a total of 33 indicators in DCAT V1, and these are estimated across a total of six scenario epic combinations. All right, with that further insight into the actual indicators that constitute DCAT version one, um, I, I wanted to reiterate here that these indicators were really only consistently and continuously available for CONUS Alaska Hawaii locations in the initial version of the tool. Um, again, characterization for overseas uh, locations was largely limited on the several fronts that I described in, in, in the previous slides. Um, so that really sets the stage for our current effort. Uh, we were tasked through this CERTA BSTCP project to address these weaknesses and gaps in overseas representation in DCAT version one. Uh, so the first step in this was to identify new globally consistent and authoritative data sources that could inform the indicator calculations beyond CONUS. Then moving beyond this identification phase, uh, we were charged with actually conducting the heavy work of obtaining, translating, and processing these data sources into the actual forms of indicators that DCAT uses. And ultimately, our DOD sponsors anticipated that this effort would lead to a new version of DCAT called DCAT Overseas uh, that could be used for climate assessment across DOD's installations, um, as well as those of partner nations around the entire world. Uh, looking at the right visual here, I'll, I'll very briefly note 
that several versions of the tool were envisioned at diff different geographic delineations. Uh, so a global version of the tool, another version of the tool focusing specifically on DOD regional combatant commands, and another one looking at partner nations. Um, but I'll really be focusing most of my attention for this presentation on the global version of the tool. All right, so in the first phase of our effort, we conducted a fairly exhaustive search and review for data sources that might be used uh, for informing the indicator calculations in DCAT overseas. Uh, while clearly I don't have the time today to go through all the data sources uh, that we reviewed uh, across all 33 indicators, I did want to share out one example of this review process for a single indicator um, just to illustrate the types of criteria that we were considering uh, through this process. So here specifically, um, I'm showing a table comparing global extreme sea level data sets that uh, were potential candidates for the coastal flood extent indicator in DCAT. And, and on this table, you can see four different data sets that we identified as potential candidates. Um, once we identified any individual uh, data set as a candidate, we then evaluated that product across several criteria. Um, so in the case of the ESL data set, you can see here that we first evaluated the data set on the basis of compatibility with DCAT version one. Uh, we did have a major precedent here in the previous tool, and we weren't aiming to reinvent the wheel. So we wanted to kind of understand how consistent that indicator or that data source is with uh, the original indicator calculation. Now, number two, our resolution was a, a key consideration. Um, as it pertains to DOD installations at sites, uh, we have a general interest in resolving the climate hazard at that particular level. So that's a major criteria. Um, authority was also a key evaluation criteria. And while authority is somewhat widely defined from DOD's vantage, this might include considerations of, say, uh, scientific defensibility uh, of the product. It may include um, adoption or management of the product from another trusted governmental institution um, and so forth. And fourthly here, uh, we did look at ease of use and accessibility of the data source as a key criteria. Obviously, these data products are only as useful insofar as they are actually accessible, usable, and understandable. So that was a key evaluation criteria for us. So again, this type of data review was conducted across all 33 indicators of, of interest. Um, I'm just showing one here as, as an example of that. I, I will note as well uh, that we are finalizing a report that actually describes and documents this data review process that's currently in sort of final internal review stages. And our hope is that that's a report that can be made available upon request and approval of our DOD partners uh, to serve as a resource for the community here. All right, with that example illustrating uh, the data review process, I wanted to now turn our attention to a large subset of indicators that are unique in that they actually all rely on climate model output for their calculation. And in particular, they're all taking climate model output from the coupled model intercomparison project, or CMIP in short, as their ultimate source of data. Uh, so for those of you unfamiliar with CMIP, this is essentially uh, an international climate modeling project in which a collection of individual climate models developed by the world's leading scientific institutions are organized into a single model comparison framework. Uh, for the purposes of DCAT, in most cases, uh, the CMIP-based DCAT indicators are re relying on either temperature or precipitation variables that are coming from these climate models. So again, as you can see on the slide here, a very significant subset of our DCAT indicators, uh, nearly half of them are relying on this climate model data derived from the CMIP model experience. Um, I'll also note that uh, we have different um, spatial resolutions of CMIP data that were available for um, the various uh, geographies considered in, in, in DCAT version one. All right, so similarly, as with all the other DCAT indicators, our first step for the DCAT overseas effort was to really understand and evaluate what data products might be available for our different geographies of interest. So here is an example, uh, just as another illustration of our data review effort. I wanted to highlight one particular suite of products that we looked at. Uh, this is uh, made available by the Coordinated Regional Climate Downscaling Experiment, or CORDEX in short. Um, and as I described on, a, on an earlier project context slide, uh, one of the goals of our data ID effort was to uh, try to identify enhanced and higher resolution products that might be available for specific regions of interest, just uh, beyond just the entire globe. And in DOD's case, this includes data that might be consistently available over regional combatant commands or data available over partner nations of interest. Um, while I won't get into the weeds of climate data downscaling approaches in this talk, I think that's a separate discussion entirely, 
Uh, there are many efforts such as Cortex that actually attempt to take global CMIP-based climate data and downscale that to particular regions of interest at higher spatial or temporal uh, resolution. Uh, in our case, we actually didn't move forward with the Cortex Cortex product for many reasons, largely due to spatial misalignment with our regions or incomplete model ensembles. But we just we did just want to show this as, as another interesting product that was considered our, during our review process for uh, the CMIP based indicators. All right, so still considering the 15 CMIP derived indicators, I now wanted to turn our attention from the data review task uh, to the actual data processing that went into this effort. Um, so for the CMIP-based indicators in DCAT overseas, uh, we ultimately landed on selecting the same data source that was used in DCAT version one for a host of reasons. Uh, this was the NASA Earth Exchange uh, Global Daily Downscale Projections, or NASA Next GDDP in short. And this is a statistically downscaled CMIP product. Um, we were in particular using CMIP 5 for this effort, um, downscaled to a quarter degree resolution. Um, and we also, uh, extracted both uh, data from RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 following the, the scenario design of DCAT version one. Now, kind of stepping back, considering that we have a list of 33 indicators for DCAT as a whole, a major overarching technical challenge of our effort was actually developing um, tractable, efficient, and replicable workflows to actually take raw climate data sources, in this instance, the NASA Next GDDP archive, and run the actual calculations to convert these data sources into DCAT indicators in a timely and an efficient manner. Um, in our case, one of the coincidental benefits of going with the NASA Next GDP, GDP source for our CMIP based indicators is that this data set was already uh, available on Google Earth Engine. Uh, so we had our resident uh, PNNL expert, Jillian Dynas, uh, develop a GE based workflow that starts with a very large 30 terabyte data set. Uh, runs this data set through various scripts that in turn generate our annual values for each of the CMIP based indicators. And then on the tail end, uh, we finally conduct some post processing to calculate the epic scenario statistics, uh, the information that actually gets ingested by, by DCAP. Um, so through leaning on these cloud computing resources, we were able to save a huge amount of both human and computational effort in, in accomplishing this task here. Um, also note that as a, a supplement to the DCAT effort, we're working on a related a climate data processing repository and an accompanying uh, scientific publication that can hopefully serve as, as a public facing version of this particular workflow uh, to the benefit of the wider scientific community. All right, in the next set of slides here, I wanted to now move from kind of looking at the data review and the under the hood data processing for the CMIP based indicators uh, to the more fun stuff of actually showing what different forms of, of indicators look like at the tail end of this process. Um, of note here is that for these visuals, I've picked timeframes uh, that are not quite exactly aligned with those that are actually used in DCAT. This was both to protect the sensitivity of, of information in the DCAT tool itself, and to actually illustrate just the flexibility of our data processing pipeline and workflow um, in developing these custom indicators. Um, so here in particular, uh, we're looking at the days above 95 degree indicator. Uh, on the left panel, we've shown what this looks like for the baseline period uh, across the world. And then on the right panels, we show how this indicator changes when looking into two future periods. So one roughly around mid-century from 2050 to 2059, and another looking at, at late century. And this is shown for both climate emissions scenarios. So RCP 4.5 on the top, RCP 8.5 on the bottom. And I find these results particularly striking. Um, I think days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit is an indicator that most of us can really wrap our heads around. And to imagine that in many of these scenarios by the late century, large swaths of the world, um, especially in the global south, are experiencing nearly the entire year where temps are greater than 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I think that's a, a, a particularly concerning and, and sobering outcome. Uh, moving on here, we take a look at another indicator. This is maximum five-day precipitation, again, organized across a similar panel of figures. And this is an indicator in DCAT that is largely related to a flooding hazard. And as those of us who may be familiar with, with climate model uh, might expect, uh, we see a change signal that isn't quite as strong or consistent across the globe as compared to a temperature-based indicator. Uh, but we do certainly still see an increase in this metric as we move into the later stages of the century 
and also as we move from the, the lower to the higher climate emission scenarios. As a final example, um, using this particular kind of organization of visual, uh, I'm showing here drought year, the, the, the drought year frequency indicator, which is based on the standardized precipitation evaporation index or SPEI. Um, and I, I wanted to show this one as it was one of the indicators that was more complex and intensive to actually calculate, as those of you familiar with SPI uh, calculations may be aware. And we were indeed able to conduct this type of advanced calculation at scale through our uh, data processing pipeline. Um, one thing to note here about outcomes is that SPEI is uh, standardized, standardized based on a historical distribution. In our case, this uh, historical distribution being from 1950 to 2005. Uh, so this is why we're basically seeing zero drought years in our baseline period, uh, since that's the, the period we're standardizing to. But then we can see how drought year frequency uh, changes and increases strikingly relative to that baseline period for uh, the future scenarios of change. Okay, so all the, the examples I've shown up till now are looking spatially at a global map, then visualizing the average of some indicator over a time period of interest. Uh, what we can also do through the set of tools that we've developed is pick any quarter degree grid cell or a point location around the world, say a specific city or a specific DOD installation of interest, and pull out a time series of, of annual indicator values for that particular location of interest. Uh, so here we're showing one such example where we've kind of picked a random location of interest and we're showing three different DCAT indicators for that particular location um, across the two climate scenarios of interest. So just to illustrate many different ways to interrogate and work with, with the output here. All right, I know I've spent most of uh, the bulk of the time today looking at processing and output for the CMIP based indicators, but I did wanna pop in a slide here that serves an, as an illustration of an indicator that does not rely on CMIP modeling output and also uniquely does not rely on any future model uh, data. So for the tropical cyclone precipitation indicator, we're relying on historical data sets. This was based on a discussion with our DOD partners um, and uh, uh, a decision that authoritative future data sets for this tropical uh, cyclone indicator are not available. And so what we've done here is combined um, two historical data sets, the best tracks data set alongside a global historical precipitation data set to actually calculate this particular indicator. Uh, so again, just to illustrate, we're not only working with CMIP based, based data and we're not only dealing solely with future model projected data, but in cases where we deem it's appropriate um, and future data is unavailable, we also leverage historical data sets for the calculation of our indicators. All right, as a bit of final analysis to leave you with here, I wanted to highlight that the data processing pipeline we've developed really serves as a foundation for any number of climate data analysis that might be of interest to the Department of Defense. And this goes well beyond just the calculation of indicators for input into DCAT. Uh, as an example of this, we, re we recently conducted a rapid turnaround task comparing the CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 data sets at the request of our DOD partners. Um, and mainly here, we want to understand how CMIP versus CMIP CMIP-5 versus CMIP-6 and these two different products uh, influence uh, basically inferences we make about the evolution of, of climate hazard exposure. And the workflow and tools we developed really allowed us to conduct this analysis in, in a matter of days rather than weeks or months. Um, we, could, we could have probably done this even faster if it weren't for due to some peculiarities of the two different data sets. Um, so this is again, just to illustrate that while the effort was specifically focused on the generation of DCAT indicators, um, I think as sort of a, a collateral benefit, it, it more broadly provides a foundation of processing tools for any number of climate analysis. All right, to wrap up here, some, some concluding thoughts to leave you with. Uh, the first here, just to step back from more of the technical um, work is that raw climate model output from sources such as CMIP can feel overwhelming to deal with for many applied users and decision makers. And the climate indicators such as those utilized in DCAT and the focus of our effort really offer a more tractable and interpretable means to interface and uh, understand climate data. Uh, the second concluding point here is that through this CERTIP ESTCP supported effort, we were able to extend the DCAT tool for improved calculation of these indicators uh, globally. And I, I believe this greatly enhances the utility of DCAT for DOD planning purposes. Uh, thirdly, alongside the calculation of these indicators, we were able to innovate new data processing workflows that allow for efficient processing of raw climate data. 
which serves uh, DCAT well, but also has applications beyond. Um, as a final slide here, um, in terms of benefits to DOD, through both our data review and processing effort alongside the broader efforts of the DASD ENRO team working on DCAT, um, this new version of, of DCAT overseas is now available uh, to all DOD planners and partners with a common access card. So it's, it's an actual tangible tool that's, that's, that's sitting online and, and ready to use. Um, secondly, the cloud-based workflow provides a template for climate data processing. So as an example, should the DOD want to introduce a new indicator or update, tweak an existing one, there's really just a rich array of existing source code to serve as a starting point for this and really expedite that style of work. And thirdly, as we gave an example of through the CMIP5 versus CMIP6 comparison, we also have a foundational toolkit for conducting climate data analysis uh, that extends well beyond just the generation of DCAT climate indicators, um, again, serving as a versatile tool for any number of climate data analysis that might be of interest to, to the DOD and its partners. Uh, so with that, I just wanted to thank you all for your attention. Um, and then at this time, I'd be happy to take uh, questions or comments. Thank you so much, Jim. Just a reminder for our audience members, you can submit questions using the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, we ask that you only use the chat for technical difficulties. Jim, we have received a number of questions that we're gonna relate to you. The first one is from the Department of Energy. Can you explain why air visibility is not included on the list of effects of climate change? Things like air quality, PM 2.5, et cetera. Sure, um, and this is probably a question that I would ultimately defer to our DOD uh, sponsors on. Um, when we embarked on this work, we already had a pre-existing set of DCAT indicators, and we weren't involved in the actual identification of new indicators of sorts. Uh, that said, I, I, I think there could be argument for including um, climate hazards as such uh, around air quality, for example. We do include um, indicators that are related so that there are there is sort of a wildfire hazard category. Um, and so there are categories in which sort of uh, an indicator such as this would be um, perhaps considered. But I, I will say that um, just based upon discussions with our DOD partners as well, uh, the inclusion, modification, addition of new indicators is, is, is always up for discussion. Um, this is always kind of uh, an ongoing and evolving discussion among the DCAT team. And so to hear um, input from the wider community on, on what might be um, included in, in future versions of DCAT for more comprehensive climate hazard analysis um, is always welcome. And so that's, that's a good one to, to note. Thank you so much. This next question is from the US Military Academy. How is the heat index calculated without humidity data? Uh, sure, so there actually is, um, in particular, if we look at the high heat index days uh, uh, indicator, it's a combination of, of temperature and, and relative humidity that's taken into account. Now to um, the, the, the question that was asked, uh, in the CMIP-5 projections, we actually don't have projections of, of relative humidity that are amenable for kind of uh, that, that calculation of height index days. So this was actually a, a bit of a unique indicator where we combined future projections of temperature alongside historical data on relative humidity to get at that question. Um, it was uh, obviously had its weaknesses in terms of combining historical and future projected data, but we deemed that that was uh, the best path forward. And we also recognize that high heat index days is, is a very important indicator as it pertains to, to DOD interest. So we wanted to include it. Um, as we look ahead, you know, I think there are new products emerging that um, account for future and include future projections of, of, of relative humidity. And so uh, we, we certainly, I know that the DOD and, and, and ourselves as well have sort of an eye on those products and, and future improvements that can be made to this particular indicator. Thank you so much, Jim. This next question is from EA Engineering. Does your climate assessment tool contain capability for climate indicator download from each climate model? Um, so our tool does not specifically 
um, account for like a download functionality. So if you were to go into DCAT, like that would not be available. That said, um, all of the indicators that you saw in our presentation, especially uh, particularly the CMIP based ones, um, we run the annual indicator calculations per GCM in the CMIP ensemble. So we actually have kind of sitting behind DCAT, like in terms of the data sources, uh, that information that we've processed from the individual climate models. At the moment, again, that's just not um, a service of, of DCAT where that, that information is accessible and downloadable, but it is there and it's used in our calculations. Thank you. This next question is from NAFAC Exquick. Does the um, assessment tool update its projections as new data becomes available? And if so, how often are these updates? Um, so at the moment, there's no um, regular cadence or automated sort of update of the tool and the projections. Um, there have been sort of iterations of the tool that are released on a more kind of just targeted basis based upon new data sets that come out. Um, so, for example, with the DCAT overseas um, work that we just conducted, um, that was a release that, it, it, that attempted to account for the kind of the latest authoritative, uh, the latest authoritative data sets. Um, now, there are sort of ongoing discussions in regards to sort of when these updates make sense based upon the release of new products. So, for example, an ongoing discussion is. Um, whether to move to CMIP 6, for example, or not. The current version of the tool includes uh, CMIP 5 projections. And so that's that's an ongoing discussion that, again, is kind of beyond the scope of this particular effort, but is certainly on the radar of our um, DOD DCAT partners and, and part of the discussion. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, made on a more sort of intentional, I'd say less automated basis. Great, thank you, Jim. You mentioned that the tool is readily available, uh, how can interested parties access the tool? Sure. So first of all, it's 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 readily accessible for those with a common access card, a, a CAT card. And so long as you do have a, a, a CAT card, um, there is basically just a, a pretty simple website you can go to. I can drop that website into chat after, after the Q&A session here, if, if that's of, of interest. Um, but you simply, yeah, click on the website and enter your CAC information and, and you're good to go. Thank you, Jim. And uh, a few more questions before we turn it over to, um, to Peter for his presentation. How is climate model uncertainty accounted for um, in the assessment tool indicator calculations? Sure. So that's, yeah, that's a good one. Um, the, the DCAT accounts for uncertainty on a couple of fronts. So first of all, there is scenario uncertainty around these climate projections. And uh, the, the, the selection of RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 was uh, fairly intentional. And that's a pretty wide band of climate emissions uh, uncertainty that the DOD uh, wanted to consider in its projections. Um, secondly, uh, the sort of philosophy behind DCAT is to take an averaging approach across uh, individual uh, global uh, circulation models. And so when we're dealing with the CMIP data set, for example, we're looking over the entire ensemble of, of models included uh, in, 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 in CMIP in particular. And so that's the, the manner in which um, uncertainty is being accounted for, kind of model uncertainty across these, these, these different uh, frameworks. Um, now, again, there are many other modes of, of, of uncertainty, um, initial condition uncertainty in the models and, and so forth. And, and these are sort of ongoing, again, internal discussions within DOD in regards to sort of how to really contend with the, 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 the different sources of uncertainty when it comes to climate models. Um, but again, there is this kind of strict accounting for of scenario and model uncertainty and ongoing discussions in terms of like how to tackle uncertainty um, from other forms. Wonderful. This is a great and comprehensive response, Jim. One last question. Um, you and we got a number of questions about the database, the data sets, and whether you could make them available. We encourage the authors of those questions to deal to contact you directly. But can you at least 
provide some insight into what defines an authoritative data set that can be used for the assessment tool. Sure, sure. So there's um, a lot of consideration in terms of um, what makes it into a DCAT indicator and the data sources that make it into a DCAT indicator around data authority. And perhaps this also kind of relates to the question that was asked initially around like, why not some new indicator? And uh, the DOD kind of uh, pays a lot of concern to this 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 notion of authority. And many there there are many ways to kind of think about and consider authority. One first and foremost, just thinking about the scientific defensibility of the product. Um, so oftentimes that looks like uh, a peer-reviewed publication of the methodology that has been sort of widely accepted in in the broader scientific community. Um, so there's a pretty high bar for kind of just scientific credibility and defensibility. Um, another element that might add to authority is whether such products are sort of maintained, uh, managed, kind of pushed forward by trusted uh, institutions, organizations. So oftentimes if uh, another governmental organization, again, with very sort of clear, transparent processes for processing and managing the data are kind of the brokers of the data that can add to the authority of the product. Um, so yeah, those are, I think, two of the key criteria. There are others as well that relate to authority, but but hopefully that gives you a sense for, for what that sort of process entails in terms of deeming sort of how authoritative a product is. Great, thank you so much, Jim. We'll get back to any unanswered questions towards the end of the webinar if the time allows it. But at this point, we'd like to transition to our second speaker today. Uh, who is Dr. Peter Larson. Pete is a staff scientist and leader of the Energy Markets and Policy Department at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Pete conducts research and analysis on the economics of electricity, reliability and resilience, energy service company industry and project trends, long-term electric utility planning, risk to infrastructure from extreme events, and islanded power uh, systems. Early in his career, he worked at the Institute of Social and Economic Research in Anchorage, Alaska, and the Societal Impact Program at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. He received a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Montana at Missoula, a master's degree in management and science engineering from Stanford, a master's degree in national natural resources economics from Cornell, and then a doctorate in management science and engineering uh, from Stanford. Uh, Pete, we're delighted to have you. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, like Jim, I wanted to just acknowledge uh, the ESTP uh, family for funding this work, giving me the opportunity to present to all of you today. Uh, that family also includes, you know, the the supporting institutions like Geosyntech and and Noblis, which really make these these projects and opportunities available to researchers uh, like myself. Um, I'll start off by just saying uh, one thing. Um, I am I am a jack of all trades, master of none. I am not an engineer. <laughs> I am not a climate scientist. I'm actually an applied economist, and so. I work with different teams of climate scientists and engineers and software developers to build tools that are interdisciplinary in nature. And so I'm gonna share one of those tools uh, with you today. So uh, I'll briefly introduce this project. So I'll talk a little bit about why we undertook this project, which we call WELDER, that's the acronym. Uh, talk about some demonstration partners that uh, we worked with uh, early on in the project to really ground this in reality. Uh, some of the methods and results that we use, I'll, I'll summarize you know, the conclusions of this work, the benefits, of course, to the Department of Defense, and what we're going to be doing uh, in the near future, and actually what we're working on right now, which we call Welder 2.0. Um, and then I'll just uh, finish up with some acknowledgments of, of the people that really do the hard work on this project. So we developed a tool. It's actually a plug-in. Um, the, the acronym is WELDER, uh, Weather Effects on the Life Cycle of DOD uh, Equipment Replacement. And we partnered up with the US Army Corps of Engineers. And one of the reasons we partnered up with the Army Corps is they have this 
really amazing rich database called Builder. And Builder is a sustainment management system. And I'll talk about Builder in a bit more detail later. But I can tell you this, Builder includes uh, 212,000 or so buildings in this massive database. Uh, buildings are made up of systems like an HVAC system. And these systems are made up of parts, which we call components or Builder calls components. And Builder's used by facilities planners uh, to really understand what different parts, systems, facilities need to undergo maintenance in order to continue to perform and meet the, the mission and the goals of the Department of Defense. Prior to Welder coming along, Builder did not consider vulnerability to extreme weather. Builder essentially looked at what the expected lifespan of you know, a fan blade was, uh, when it needed to be replaced or repaired, and that, that's how the, the planning process worked. Um, it didn't account for the fact that things are changing and, and in some places quite rapidly, and those affect the lifespan of all of these components and systems and facilities. And so that was our pitch to DOD, I guess, four or so years ago, four or five years ago. And then I'm happy to report that we've completed Welder 1.0 and we're moving on to Welder 2.0. So uh, no big surprise, um, DOD has identified climate change as a critical national security threat. Um, planners, policymakers, you know, everybody from the facility down to the facility level up to, you know, the office of the secretary of defense, they need information about what's, you know, what, what's the de degradation of all the assets under the DOD umbrella? What are the additional maintenance costs that may be expected in the future with and without extreme weather uh, risk? And so that's what, this is the void that welder essentially fills. We, take uh, you know, climate model output, you know, downscale climate model output, and we project extreme weather risk into the future. And then we look at how these different extreme weather events may impact uh, infrastructure into the future. So one of the key things that we felt was quite important, and I and I believe DOD agreed with us, is you know reaching out to some partners at the earliest stages of this project. And one of the things that we did is we identified some, essentially some power users of the Builder Sustainment Management System. We sent them a, a little questionnaire and we asked them some questions like, hey, what are the severe weather threats that are impacting the base here? Um, can you tell us, you know, Give us an example historically when there's been damage that's occurred at the base. What type of damage occurred? Were there thresholds that you saw more damage? So if, if the wind speed was greater than 50 miles an hour, did you see more damage versus 40 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour? And so we put out this questionnaire, uh, interacted with these four demonstration sites, Fort Leonard Wood, Fort Cavazos, which was formerly known as Fort Hood, the Army National Guard in Florida, and then Fort Johnson uh, in Louisiana. We asked them about severe weather threats and again, when damage occurred to these facilities and at what thresholds did they, did they believe that the damage really you know, sort of got amplified. And so that was why we reached out to these demonstration partners very early on because they helped inform you know, the extreme weather metrics that we ended up generating as part of this project. So this technology, Welder, consists of five key components. First, we have this massive database, similar to what Jim was just talking about. We have this massive database of extreme weather projections, historical and future, um, for a bunch of different metrics that, again, were selected based on information that we collected at the demonstration sites. Um, we have this massive database of infrastructure, facility data from the builder sustainment management system. And so we have millions and millions of records of all these different facilities, the systems and components that make up those facilities, including their cost, their lifespan, and, and so forth. Uh, we have this third part is a real, it's the linchpin of the project. It's what we call either the distress or the damage association matrix. And this is essentially the engine of welder. It takes extreme weather projection, and it looks at how that extreme weather uh, may change the lifespan or the depreciation of components. Um, and that's a key 
linchpin in our, in our work is this damage association matrix. The next is an application programming interface. This is essentially a communication channel uh, between the builder sustainment management system and the welder tool. And finally, we've developed a user interface for exploratory analysis. You're able to look at you know, the extreme weather projections on a map, zoom in on a, any particular location in the continental US and see, you know, given these metrics that we've generated projections for, wh what are we expecting at Fort Cavazos, for example, in terms of annual number of days with rainfall exceeding two inches, for example. Um, the user interface also allows users from the facility level all the way up to the OSD level to look at what the extreme weather related risk is, uh, including the costs, which we call a risk premium. So this is just a schematic describing uh, the welder components. Up in the upper left, you see the NERSC, that's the supercomputer here at Berkeley Lab where I work. That was where a lot of the, the processing of the extreme weather uh, projections took place. And then we squirreled those away into an extreme event database. You can see this event distress association matrix in the right upper right part of this diagram. That's that linchpin part of the project I mentioned where it correlates changes in extreme weather to changes in the depreciation of components. Um, and then we have, of course, the exploratory analysis tool, the big database of, of builder uh, components, the sustainment management system that the, the tool is hitting against. And then users of builder will uh, in, the, in the near future be able to fire up welder within builder run some scenarios, see what the costs are, and then it may change their decisions around facility planning. So back to the extreme weather database, again, very similar uh, in some ways to what was just described in the previous presentation. We used, um, you know, the CMIX, CMIP6 uh, data. Um, we basically created a bunch of extreme weather metrics uh, going out into the future. I think we went out to 2060. Uh, just because that's within kind of the lifespan range of, of all the assets uh, in Builder at the moment. Um, and so you see all these different thresholds. And so we've, we've got a range of, you know, if you're interested in high temperature, the metric is annual number of days where the maximum temperature is above 75 and it goes 80, 85, 90, 95, all the way up to 110. Um, and this is, you know, one example of a metric. As you can see, these are an annual number of days. That's the metric that we felt was most useful uh, for communicating to stakeholders, but also in terms of looking at uh, damage, um, additional maintenance to facilities. This is how the damage association matrix is pinging against this annual number of days metric that you see all these different uh, extreme weather metrics. So the builder component inventory, this is the builder sustainment management system. Again, I mentioned it's got tons of data on the existing condition of components across the DOD portfolio. These are facilities, um, the systems and the components that make up those systems. You have millions of components in this database, uh, information about their lifespan, the replacement cost, uh, the current condition is all in this database. And this is, serves as the basis for really looking at risk from all the way down to a component level, an individual fan blade, all the way up to the entire DOD portfolio that's in Builder, which uh, represents about four or 500 billion, with a B, billion dollars worth of capital investment. So this is a, a massive database. And this tool allows you to look at not only risk down to the lowest level, but also up to the highest levels of the DOD organization. Damage association matrix. So basically the way this works is in the builder system, there are some parameters that show how uh, a, like a fan blade, for example, is expected to deteriorate uh, into the future. It's got a current condition and expected lifespan. And this, this um, builder system has these two parameters called an alpha and a beta parameter that change the shape uh, essentially of this depreciation curve. And so what we were able to do is then look at how that alpha and beta parameter may change under extreme weather and then see how it impacts both the 
the maintenance plan, but also the costs associated with, with incurring those, those, those maintenance activities. I really want to stress an important point, though. Welder is a framework. We have the ability to use different climate model output. We have the ability to tweak the assumptions in the damage association matrix. It's a platform to be able to do some pretty sophisticated uh, risk analysis and cost analysis of extreme weather related risk to facilities and all the systems and components. So, you know, if we decide or DOD decides, hey, use this climate model, we have the ability to run the welder framework with something different. So it's meant to be a platform for uh, a lot of future work. Big thing we're working on right now is the builder welder connection. So as you all might be aware, um, it's always challenging hooking up to IT systems, especially in the DOD world. And so our team is working closely with the Army Corps of Engineers, IT staff and software developers to actually connect builder and welder, the live version of welder to the live version of builder. We built the Welder 1.0 on an obfuscated database, basically a database of Builder that was scrambled um, because it contained some sensitive data. Uh, but now what we're talking about doing and what we're actually doing is installing a version of Welder behind the firewall at the Army Corps of Engineers, CERL, or Construction Engineering Research Lab. And Welder will basically run next to Builder in the same environment. And all that information and all the analysis will take place within, an, within a firewall. So that's the, the connection challenges that we're working through right now. Again, as I mentioned, you know, Builder, what happens is a user kicks off an extreme weather scenario in Builder. It fires up Welder. Uh, Welder plays around with these alpha and beta parameters for an individual component or group of components or a group of sites, sends them back over to Builder. And the users and builder then see a new work action report. Hey, instead of replacing that fan blade in five years, you should replace that fan blade in three years. And here's the additional cost due to extreme weather. So we built this online user interface. In the next few slides, I'm going to touch on what this interface looks like. Um, we've gotten a lot of favorable feedback on it. We tried to keep it um, clean and simple and modern looking. Um, and communicate you know, some pretty sophisticated and complex information to users that may not be climate scientists, maybe facility planners, or maybe they're in the office of the Secretary of Defense and they really just wanna know what are the costs. So we try to keep the user interface somewhat simple um, for a wide range of users because it's easy, as Jim pointed out, it's really easy to get confused. There's so much information coming out of all these different models. And then you add in the infrastructure into it and the damage you know, it becomes very challenging for users. So we try to keep a very simple, clean look to the exploratory analysis tool. So basically, as I mentioned before, if you're in Builder and we've got all these Builder users, you're gonna click create a welder scenario. You're gonna identify, you know, um, you know, a particular facility or a group of facilities or a base. And you're gonna say, all right, run welder. And it's gonna look at all the extreme weather threats uh, at Fort Cavazos, it's going to alter the depreciation curves of every component at Fort Cavazos that's in Builder. And then it's going to spit that information back to Builder so that users can see what are the maintenance costs associated with that extreme weather, but also, um, you know, what's, what's the work action plan? Maybe we need to change when we're going to do a roof replacement, for example. So at the highest level in the user interface, uh, the user gets sent to what we call a, a scenario page here. Um, the scenarios you can see are kind of hyperlinked down below. These are scenarios that that particular user and builder has run before. Um, the hierarchy of, of, of welder is, and builder for that matter, is it starts at the organizational level. This could be income, installation management command, uh, down to a site, down to a facility and then down to the component. And the component, like I said, is the smallest level of granularity or the finest level of granularity in Builder. It's, it's an individual fan blade or a belt um, or a brick <laughs> or a group of bricks. It's the most basic elements in this Builder SMS. And that's where we assess the extreme weather threat. 
So once you click on a, a particular scenario, here we're looking at the IMCOM B30 only scenario. What it's gonna do for this particular organization, IMCOM B30 scenario, um, it's gonna estimate uh, what the risk premium is uh, and what the risk rating is for all of the components that are under this organization. And the risk premium is the annualized cost associated with reducing the building component service life because of extreme weather. Um, and again, this premium is calculated down to the smallest level and then aggregated up depending on what level of detail you want to see. So an organization view would be something that a, you know, a fairly uh, high ranking uh, official in the DOD, this is something that they might look at because it's, a, it's looking at a range of different locations across the country and looking at the total risk, extreme weather related risk to those facilities. So if you click on the site, which is underneath the organization, here we're looking at the Callisburg site. So it looks like Callisburg is in Kyleen, Texas, which is where Fort Cavazos is. And there's a whole bunch of facilities. I've truncated this graphic here, but there's a whole slew of facilities at this particular site. And here you can see what the risk premium is. I'll also point out, we talked about uncertainty in the last presentation. We produced some uncertainty or likelihood bounds around the, the estimates based on the ensemble of, of models in the CMEP-6. So we're presenting in this case, you know, the 10th or the 90th and the 50th percentile, but we have the ability to generate a, a range of different percentiles. So we're trying to get at some of the uncertainty we're focused on the model uncertainty here. I'll talk about some of the other uncertainties we're going to account for in Welder 2.0. Once you click on the facility, so you see this facility down on the bottom there, then it takes you in to a facility page. And this is a specific facility. It's just called Electrical Facilities. Uh, it was built in 2012. Um, it has a total present re replacement value. So this is a pretty small facility. It looks like about $10,000. Um, and there's a risk premium associated with this particular facility. That's the summation of all the components that are being impacted by extreme weather in that particular facility. If you click down to the component, now you get into where the action is. This is where the extreme weather is impacting a specific component. And here we're looking at a looks like a cooling like a chilled water system and you can see we've got a graph showing what the depreciation was without extreme weather basically prior to welder and what the 50th and 90th percentile depreciation is under the different extreme weather hazards that are impacting this specific component i'm only showing one here because i had to truncate it but you can see one of the extreme weather damage modes for this particular component is wind damage. It's an external HVAC system. So users have the ability to dive even deeper to see what are what are all the things that are being impacted impacting this specific component. We also have a tool that all of you can go look at right now. It's at welder.lbl.gov. I showed the link earlier, welder.lbl.gov. Um, you won't be able to log into the tool because it's still being connected to Builder, but you will be able to click on the climate recon button up top and it allows you to look at all the different extreme weather projections in, a, in a, what we think is a very visually appealing way. Um, you pick the starting year, the end year, the metric, the threshold, uh, the confidence level, like I mentioned. And it just, you can zoom right into Fort Cavazos and see what's the annual number of inches, you know, um, annual number of days with inches greater than, you know, two in a given year. Uh, so you can zoom right in and see what's going on. We put this out there just because it allows users of Welder to like really dig in and say, okay, why is that component saying there's going to be damage because of rainfall? Now you can zoom in and see why, what the rainfall change that's actually driving Welder, uh, the Welder results. We published a report, uh, late or I guess mid mid last year 2023 documenting the welder 1.0 project. So in conclusion, um, you know, prior to welder, the builder sustainment management system, which contains hundreds of billions of dollars of assets didn't account for extreme weather. 
So we stepped in, uh, built a tool that looks at the extreme weather related risk to all the facilities within the builder SMS. Uh, we use the LBNL supercomputer NERSC to generate uh, the downscaled extreme weather projections. We put likelihoods around those uh, projections. We also put likelihoods within some of the damage, uh, the damage association matrix. So there's sort of a, a compounding uncertainty that happens because we're not certain how a building may respond if the wind speeds are greater than 70 miles an hour, for example. Um, and then we looked at how those projected extreme weather metrics impact the degradation profile of components, systems, facilities, sites, and organizations. And the tool has the ability then to generate new work action reports to help facility planners, but also, um, you know, OSD determine what are the maintenance needs just associated with extreme weather um, for all the facilities that they track in Builder. So the benefits to the Department of Defense, uh, I'm sure some of you know, there was a presidential executive order 14008 calls for climate risk analysis to be incorporated in all planning and processes. Of course, Welder uh, steps right in and that's really what we're focused on and that's what DCAT is doing as well. Um, it helps make informed decisions. You know, if you're thinking about when do I replace that roof, now you have more information about the extreme weather risk that help hopefully help you make a better decision about that particular component. Um, and then it has the ability, as I said, to be rolled right up to the organizational level, um, the service level, and look at what are the total costs. And that can help with long-term budget planning and asks of Congress in terms of uh, in, ensuring that um, you know, missions are met uh, at, at DOD. So for Welder 2.0, uh, one of the things you know, Jim talked about this a little bit. They they looked at RCP 4.5 and 8.5. That's one way of looking at, you know, the scenario based uncertainty. For our analysis for Welder 1.0, we only looked at 8.5. So we're going to be running alternative RCP comparisons to add to some of the likelihood estimates or the uncertainty uh, that we generate from this tool. Um, as I mentioned, the damage association matrix is the linchpin of this tool. So we're going to be improving that. Um, and big thrust of work with the Army Corps of Engineers is really revisiting that damage association matrix, seeing if we can validate it more with observed damage after storms as they occur. Um, a big thing that's happening at the Army Corps of Engineers is they're developing an enterprise sustainment management system. It's a multi-year project. We want to connect to the enterprise system because the old way of connecting to builder is going to become obsolete in the not too distant future. One of the things we're also going to be including is a post damage assessment module within builder. So if you're an inspector, you come out after a hurricane and you're looking at all the facilities and what's been impacted, you can quickly record what the damage is, what was damaged, what the condition is before and after. And then what we'll do is use that information to continue calibrating that damage association matrix, which is so critical uh, to this project. And then we have to do some outreach. You know, we haven't formally connected this tool yet. We're really excited, uh, but we have to get out in front of the builder users and, you know, potentially people uh, at OSD and others organizations to let them know that we have a tool that's able to estimate extreme weather related costs uh, of facilities. So I just want to acknowledge, I'm not going to list all the people off, but this has been a, a great team to work with. I, I can't speak more highly of my colleagues at Berkeley Lab, but also at the Army Corps of Engineers here. This is a tight knit team. We've been working together for four or five years. Um, and then of course the staff at our demonstration sites, um, they really helped sketch out, um, you know, what metrics we need to use to really inform uh, long-term planning uh, for their particular facilities. So thank you very much. The report that I mentioned a second ago is located at this hyperlink and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, we did get a number of questions and we encourage for those that have additional questions to get them in through the Q&A box. But the first question we received is from the Department of Energy. Are there geographical variations incorporated into the model or does it uniformly assess economic damages? In other words, is it a location specific damage calculation? Yes. So 
that's that's a really good question because it'll allow me to highlight why we think this tool uh, has potential use across the DoD uh, platform. So it's taking individual components at a specific location like Fort Cavazos or Fort Leonard Wood or you know uh, any other um, location that's in the builder SMS. It's matching those components like the fan blade to the extreme, the downscaled extreme weather metrics that impact a fan blade for that specific location. So um, to answer your question, prior to prior to welder, builder didn't look at location specific degradation. Now that we're able to correlate specific location extreme weather projections, uh, to damage, now we have the ability to look at location-specific impacts. So you can look at what the what the you know risk premium, the additional maintenance costs associated with extreme weather is for a particular facility at some particular location. You can go all the way down to that level if you want to. Great, thank you. This next question is from Homer uh, Lane LLC. Considering the number of components, hazards, locations, and age, how many damage matrices need to be defined for welder to be useful? Yeah, so the damage association matrix is essentially, you know, it's a big, it's a big table. It's boiled down. We we aggregate up some of the components into like, you know, groups of components. Uh, and then the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, the team of engineers looked at, you know, a group of components together um, and looked at, okay, what, what types of these extreme weather metrics may impact these components and how so. So there are millions of components in Builder, but there are a lot less unique component types in Builder. Um, so we've done it down to the best level we can, but like I said earlier, it's a platform. So one of the things that we're able to do is as, as we get more and more information, we'll be able to continue to calibrate those relationships that, you know, the impact between extreme weather and degradation of, of facilities. So there are not 9 million unique component types in, in Builder. There are I don't know, maybe 500 or 1,000. Maybe I, I'd have to look at our matrix just to see what the, the final count is. But some grouping occurred just to get it to solve. But again, the sky's the limit. We can continue to refine this. This could be a lifetime of work to continue to improve a tool like this. Thank you so much. Um, this next question is from uh, LBNL. When you roll up welder results to the organizational level, are you able to determine which types of extreme events, like wind, heat waves, et cetera, if not accounted for, are most costly to DOD? And if so, have you looked into that? And what are those types of extreme events? Yeah, so we're not, to be clear, we're not simulating a, a specific storm in the future. We're projecting extreme weather metrics that, you know, for example, annual number of days with snowfall greater than eight inches and annual number of days with wind speeds greater than 40 miles an hour. So we're not necessarily projecting individual storms, but if you took some of these metrics together, you could basically infer that these are storm-like conditions in the future. You know, if you took snowfall and wind, you know, you're you're essentially projecting a year that's maybe has more blizzards than a past year. Um, I don't know if I answered the question. I had a little bit hard time tracking the first part of it. I think this is sufficient. So let's move on to the next one. What is the plan for deploying the Wilder tool for builder users? Yep. So we are working out, like literally as we speak, we're working out the connection issues, which basically involves us putting a version of Wilder behind the firewall at the Construction Engineering Research Lab at the Army Corps of Engineers in Illinois. Um, 
And once we get those two located together, then we'll be testing the communications between the two. And then from that point on, I'm going to have a, a number of conversations with my colleagues at the Army Corps of Engineers who run the builder system about how we communicate this to users and how we conduct training um, to, to inform builder users about what it is and how to use the tool to its full capability. We're also sort of, you know, trying to, to program to a moving target because as I mentioned, um, there's an enterprise system, a brand new enterprise sustainment management system being developed by the Army Corps of Engineers. It's, a, it's basically being rolled out right now. And so we wanna basically connect to that version of Builder, which is an instance within the enterprise system. So stay tuned, we're gonna do some trainings and outreach, extensive outreach when we get these two talking to each other, um, which I anticipate happening uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you. And one last question before we pull Jim back in to, to answer. Uh, some questions with you. Do you have any efforts? Are you conducting any efforts to validate the accuracy of the welder tool? Yeah. So uh, if you go to the report uh, that I put the, the hyperlink to, I had a little screenshot of it. Um, it was published, I think, in June 2023. Um, the report talks about some of the validation that we did. Obviously, you know, it's a little bit of a shot in the dark when you develop a matrix correlating extreme weather to damage to infrastructure. You know, this has been a persistent challenge. I've worked on this topic for a long time. And so we knew early on that we needed to do some validation to start to see are these reasonable numbers. And so we were able to get uh, some information out of Louisiana after a hurricane hit. And that helped inform a recalibration of that damage association matrix. So it was a limited example of validation, but what it did is it set up our thinking for Welder 2.0, where we're going to build a little module in Builder to collect information after there have been events at facilities so that we can get some information from across the country and continue to validate and calibrate that model or that matrix. Thank you so much. All right, Jim, if you don't mind uh, rejoining the discussion, two final questions for the both of you, and we'll start with Jim. Uh, can you share how the types of tools that you described um, for um, climate adaptation decision-making can be used um, by DOD decision-makers? And if you can provide an example, that would be outstanding. Jim? Sure. Um, yeah, I think thinking about Pete's talk here as well, there are sort of many layers of analysis that one could envision coming out of these tools. And I think one has to kind of think back as well to kind of the climate adaptation uh, decision under consideration. Um, so for example, as, as I think about DCAT, right? DCAT, one of the things DCAT is kind of purpose designed for is to provide relative indications of climate exposure across the portfolio of, of DOD sites. And so an example of sort of uh, an adaptation question might be sort of a strategic planner at the OSD level thinking about um, how this relative exposure might change. Again, looking at several sites, how resources might in turn then be, be deployed to really um, yeah, implement climate adaptation solutions given sort of those higher level, that, that sort of higher level view of, of the portfolio. Um, I think Pete's, Pete's work in Welder is a great example of how that might also be conducted at that level of analysis, but also an installation uh, manager might actually go in and, and use the tool uh, that, that has been generated there. Um, so I think, you know, like there, there is always sort of a need for like a critical mapping between the tool under consideration and the decision question at hand. And one needs to, to think about that pretty carefully and bring the appropriate tool or method to address uh, the, the, the question at hand. So that's that's sort of my high level thinking on, on this topic. Um, yeah, happy to turn it over to Pete or, or 
yeah, or move on a little. Yeah, no, thank you. Pete, would you like to add anything before we go to our final question? Yeah, I think, yeah, Jim's absolutely right. And, you know, a, a perfect example is like, let's say uh, you're a general and you're in charge of a base. You are, you know, the commander, you know, of that base and you submit budget requests every year uh, for upkeep of the facilities at that base. Um, you know, the tools like we've described here can help inform what that budget request might be considering that things are changing in the future. And if you just look at it the old way where you didn't incorporate climate model output or, you know, risk analysis like welder, you're potentially asking for less funds than you really need. And a tool like these can be useful to uh, inform, document what the additional need is to make sure that these bases, facilities uh, continue to meet their mission. Thank you both. And one last question. What do you believe are the biggest barriers to getting widespread, widespread adoption of these tools, uh, like the ones that you described? Maybe we start with you, Pete? Sure. I think um, the biggest barriers in my mind are people, <laughs> speaking for myself too, people are really busy and we're constantly shown new bells and whistles, uh, new information, both in our personal lives and professional lives. And it's hard to sort of wade through and figure out what information, new information is most useful to, to me or us. And so to me, the biggest barrier is really just getting people's attention um, to understand what the benefits of tools like DCAD and, and Welder are and why they should, why they should really take the time, uh, you know, to, to use them to inform their planning. Because everybody is just getting hammered with so much information these days and these types of tools are really important. So I think the biggest barrier is just getting people's attention um, and communicating clearly from the research teams about what we've done, why it's important and how to use it uh, to, to help them. I think that's the biggest barrier. It's, it's, it's people and it's, it's not just the researchers, it's also the users. It's, it's a sort of a combo of both. Thank you. Jim, would you like to add anything? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I will wholeheartedly echo what, what Pete said as well. Um, you know, I think what, what both of our examples maybe illustrate is that there is both sort of from an end user standpoint, both like just an information interpretability question. And secondly, there's just sort of a user experience question. So on that first front, right? Like if we have, again, highly complex granular terabytes of climate model data, no end user really knows what to do with that, right? And so um, I think both of our examples showcase efforts where there's efforts made to, to kind of translate such complex information and data into metrics that are more interpretable, more understandable by an end user. And there, I, I think there are obvious, obviously with that comes simplifications of the information that's communicated. And, and a lot of the effort of this work is trying to find the right balance between um, accurate, credible information and that interpretability. Um, the second aspect here, and I, I, I think Pete's talk hit on this well, is, is, is just the, the usability of the tools themselves, right? Like, I don't know, I have a lot of friends in the tech sector and they have huge teams of, of folks just working on UI, UX, like user interface, user experience of these tools, because it needs to be a pleasant experience to actually like interface with these tools for users to want to work with them, given the time constraints, given sort of all the things that have, that have already been, been mentioned. And so um, the, the, I think there needs to be a lot of attention paid to um, that experience and, and, and what that looks like for the user uh, as it comes to sort of really starting to see um, more uptake more adoption of, of these types of tools for DOD planning. Great, well, thank you both for doing such a great job with your presentations as well as the Q&A session. We're gonna go ahead and wrap up, but before we do so, I'd like to remind everyone that 
We have these webinars almost uh, every two weeks. Our next webinar is on Thursday, April 4. The focus will be DOD funded research efforts to develop novel technologies for PFAS treatment. Please visit the CERTUP and ESCCP webinar web page to register for this and other webinars through the end of 2024. Before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen uh, at this time. This concludes uh, today's webcast. Thank you.